so a lot of times when I when I talk um, pretty much about anything, I, I don't I don't really like to come up with a with a pre-written speech. Sometimes I'll make mental notes, but uh, but I think it's important to be present and speak to whatever to whatever is up for me and whatever is up is up for the group. And and sitting here listening to uh, to Carl, listening to uh, to Dr. Himmel, and and for the second time seeing the story of uh, of of Andrew. Um, Wow, I mean, the first time I, I, I watched it, it, it touched me, and this time it touched me even, even more because I realized that was me. And, and it, it could have very easily ended up being me in a way that would have been quite, quite tragic. And uh, I was fortunate in that when I got to college, I was a, I was a football player, so I was, I was still in a family. I, I still felt like it was, it was home, it was a second family. But when I made the next step and got into the NFL and I was by myself, that's when my social anxiety really showed its, showed its ugly head. Um, and before I, before I go on, I, I just want to get something clear here. Um, and and I, I, think, I think this is going to work. So to, to give people a sense of what it's like to live with social anxiety, um, I'm going to ask your permission to talk about um, talk about things on a deeper level, to, to say things that might be considered taboo, but I, I think is important because as we look at something as complex and complicated as, as social anxiety, I think it's important to get to the root of things. So do I have your permission to go there? Yeah. Okay, good, okay, good. All right, good. So uh, I think that the first thing that I wanna point out um, is, is something that uh, Sigmund Freud said. And uh, when he came up with the idea, something that we all pretty much, for the most part, agree with, that, there, that we all have a personal unconscious is, is what he called it, meaning that there are parts of ourselves that we don't really know much about, that sometimes we'll do things or say things, sometimes it shows up in our dreams uh, of things that usually because we're not proud of them or because they're not accepted in our culture or by our families that we tend to push down. And so they're still part of us. You know, I, I think the best image is like, uh, is, a, is an iceberg, right? Where 10% is on the top and 90% is on the bottom. And um, arbitrary numbers, but still I think it speaks to a truth that there are a lot of things that we do and we say that we don't quite understand. And also, we also have an instinct things that are, make people uncomfortable, that make us uncomfortable, we tend to push down to the surface, right? Um, and when Freud was asked, do you think this new science of, uh, of, of psychotherapy, of talk therapy is the new healer? And his response, um, speaking to uh, what Dr. Himmel pointed out uh, about our, our friend Larry here, was he said the only things that heal are love and work. And um, I think, I'll talk about work first, okay? So uh, when I think about work, the word vocation comes up and um, comes from the root vocare to mean, or to call. It's our calling. And I, I'm so happy that I'm, I'm, I'm in a place of, uh, of worship so I can use the word God, you know? And the idea that, that I, I believe that we all have a true calling. And um, sometimes, uh, most of the time, I, I, I hope it's fair to say, that our true calling, um, I think it's relevant to our culture and to our society, but sometimes it, it's usually it's much bigger. And that part of our calling is to move our culture, to move our group forward in the evolution and our ability to do the work and to love each other. You guys following me here? Okay, good. So, and so I think of, for me, uh, and I think we'll see a common theme through what we've heard today. Um, you know, I was successful. Um, I had a really good job. I was a professional football player. And to everyone around me, I found my calling. Um, but that wasn't my reality on the inside. And, and my experience, you know, part of the drive to be successful, you know, was to deal with the parts of myself that I didn't like or that I felt would be judged or the difficulties that I, that I suffered. You know, when I was a kid, people made fun of me. And I noticed that if I showed them I could run fast and be good at a sport, 
they didn't make fun of me anymore. And, and so, and so it, it made sense. And so I put so much energy into becoming a good football player that I tended to ignore what was really going on inside. And that worked. It worked until, for the most part, it worked until my, uh, my rookie year and playing for the New Orleans Saints. And first preseason game, flew down to Miami, first play of the second quarter, I had a high ankle sprain. Um, Ended up missing the whole preseason. Season started, I was still hurt. Got re-injured the first game. Pretty much struggled the whole season with injuries. Had the first season ever where I underperformed. In you know, my whole life, I'd been an overachiever. And the one crutch, which was a beautiful diamond-studded crutch that everyone loved, it broke. And, and I was stuck. And I really had to look at what was going on inside of me. And it scared the crap out of me. And like we learned, you know, I felt like everyone around me could see what I was struggling with. And, and you know, one of the things we, we learned about social anxiety is, you know, you fear harsh judgment for your mistakes. Well, what happens when a football player has a bad game? You know, harsh criticism for their mistakes. And it's not just people around you, it's everyone, or at least it, it feels that way. And, you know, being a number one draft pick, Heisman Trophy winner, center of attention, from the outside, you know, people expected me to be the happiest person in the world. I, I had achieved my dream, but internally, I, I was I was struggling. All right, so a little bit more about about myself. So, um, I consider myself um, an introvert, um, as opposed to an extrovert. And my definition of introversion means that I, I get insight, I get energy, I learn about myself from the time I spend by myself or people that really get me. Whereas an extrovert is someone who gets those same things, but from interacting with people, being social, um, you know, they, they tend to enjoy being out more. And I think because things are more social now, I think people who are introverted, it, it tends to be a stigma in and of itself. It, it tends to be uh, pathologized. And, uh, and I think part of my journey was to, um, to be proud of my affliction you know, to, to come to terms with the fact that I prefer my own company to other people's company. I mean, I personally, I think I'm more interesting than most people. But, <laughs> but, to, but to be okay with that, you know? And we, we, we heard a little bit about the word shy. Um, and as a kid, yeah, I was considered, I was kid, considered shy, but I was a good football player, so it, it, it doesn't matter. Um, and, and now as I've matured a little bit, I, I realize that I've, as I've come to know myself a little bit more and, and know who I am, I feel like I've moved from being shy to being quiet. And, and I think that the distinction here is people who are shy, they're uncomfortable being quiet. They're uncomfortable being who they are on the inside. And they have difficulty because they don't receive much support from their, their society, from their culture, for being the, the way they are. And so the first thing I, I, I would tell anyone who identifies with with some of the things that I'm saying as being introverted is, is to own it, to claim it, and, and to love it. Because I think it's, it's your path. And one of the things that I think goes along with introversion is the way that I have gotten to know who I am and, and to know myself has been times alone, the things that I like to read, the people that I feel comfortable with, with to open up to and, and, and to share. And that's how I've learned I've learned who I am. Because one of the things about anxiety, and, and we, we talked about it briefly earlier, is let's say I take one of you, any of you, and I give you uh, some cleats, give you some high socks, some knee pads, thigh pads, hip pads, some shoulder pads, give you a jersey and a helmet, and take you to, take you to the stadium in a, in a professional football game, and I say, go for it. Who here is going to be a little fearful, a little anxious, right? And so I, 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 like that, I like that analogy because, you know, for me personally, being in the NFL at the age of 22 and expected to, to be a superstar, right? Camera's put in my face. I'm supposed to, to express who I am and to show the world who I am and, and be charismatic. But at 22, I had no idea who I was. 
I had no clue who I was. And in the environment that I was, the, the techniques, the things that I needed to do to learn who I was were considered taboo or, or a stigma. And I remember it was after my second year. So I, I told you about how, how horrible my first year in the NFL was. My second year started off much better. I, um, some points in the year, I was actually leading, leading the NFC in rushing. And it was week 10. We were playing the Carolina Panthers. And I got a carry. It was a zone play to the right, made a nice run. And when I got tackled, I kind of got up and was, uh, was a little bit gimpy. And I went to the locker room, had x-rays, and realized that I, I'd broken my ankle um, on my thousandth yard. And for, for those of you who are football fans, a thousand yards in, uh, in 10 games is, is off to a good start. Um, and so I remember in the, sitting in the locker room when the, the team doctor came back and told me that my, my leg was broken and I'd be, be done for the season. I, um, I cried. I, I bawled like a baby. Thank God my other teammates weren't, weren't in the locker room yet because that would have been quite embarrassing. And, and there I was again. You know, I had rebuilt my diamond studded crutch and, and there it broke again. And uh, I have to say in this moment, I, I look back and I say, thank God. Um, because it, it sent me on a journey, you know, and, and I think, uh, you know, in the past few years, I, I've studied a lot of different, a lot of different things, and one of the things that I've, that caught my attention was, was shamanism and understanding the way shamans look at the world. And one of the things that I, that I got from there, shamans believe that when you have an illness, when you have a disease, that it's actually a calling. And, and we learned about one of the T's about toughness, uh, or what I like to call courage. And... When you're called, you know, usually through something difficult that you have to struggle with, do you have the courage to, to answer the call? And thank God, I, I did have the courage. So uh, I started reflecting on my life. I had a lot of time. I wasn't, I wasn't playing. I wasn't, I wasn't practicing. So I had a lot of time to reflect on my life. And I, and I looked around, and I realized that I wasn't happy. It, even though I was having a little bit of success, I, I wasn't happy. And I started to ask some difficult questions. And I had this realization, like, uh, something in me, something in my life has to transform. And, and you know, I really believe when you, when you hear the calling and you move in that direction, God, the universe, whatever you want to call it, has your back and supports you. So I was sitting on the couch watching television, and a commercial came on for Paxil. And as the symptoms on the screen started popping up, I was like, hey, that sounds like me. That sounds like me. Huh, that might be me. And after eight of the symptoms, and I fit six of them at the time, I realized, okay, there's something that I can do about this. And again, I had the courage to answer the call. So I picked up the phone, and I called a, uh, I called a friend of mine, and I said, hey, can you, can you find someone for me to talk to? Because I realized that I, I need some help. So uh, I went to see a, a therapist, and uh, you know, after an hour and a half, um, she said, yeah, social anxiety. Um, she says, you know, I, I, I think that's what's going on for you. And she, she put me on, on Paxil. And I, and I started my road to recovery. And, and I, I use that uh, term loosely because I think, in a sense, you know, I think we're all on a road to a certain kind of recovery. And I think a recovery of, of meaning, um, you can call it fire, you can call it passion, whatever makes life meaningful to you. Um, and I, I look at the journey that started that day, and I look at where I am now, and I stand up here telling you this with, with full confidence that social anxiety for me was a, was a blessing. And uh, it, it was interesting. Lori sent me, a, I did a, a small video to promote, to promote this event. And in the video, she sent me a, a, a script that she, she asked me to, to, or as a suggestion. And in the script, it said, I'm here to talk about social anxiety. And I noticed that there wasn't the word disorder at the end of, at the end of it. And I, and I really like that. I, I really like that. I feel like for us dealing with social anxiety on a regular basis, us introverts, that there's not many people that have our back. There are not many people that stand up for us. I mean, most of the time, we. People that, that genuinely care about us, they don't, know what, they don't know what to do with us. They don't know what to do about it. So it's difficult to find support. And I think the one place that has done an amazing job to, to support us has been the mental health, 
it's been the mental health profession. Um, but the way they do it, and based on the rules that they have to follow, there's a disorder on the end. And I think that's part of the problem. I think, you know, we're sensitive to judgment. We're sensitive to how people feel. We're, we're deep thinkers. We, we think about these things. And when we feel that we're being judged or that there's something wrong with us, it just sends us for further, further in. And, and I think that the one thing that we're, as a culture, as humanity, are starting to embrace more, thank goodness, is diversity. And, and I don't mean diversity of our, of our paint jobs, or diversity of our religion, I think diversity of, of who we are in our, in our wholeness. And, and to appreciate with curiosity who's in front of you. You know, and the, the You Matter um, logo, what I love is, is you see in the background, there are two people facing each other, ad hominem, face to face. And when we have the ability to stand in front of another person without stereotypes, without preconceived judgments, without our own fear getting in the way of, of blocking who's in front of us, we can truly see people. And the only way you can truly love someone is to truly see someone. And one of the things that I, that I learned in the process, looking in the mirror with all the judgments, is to move to a place where I made a priority in my life to love myself. So that I had the courage to find my calling, to find my work, and to do what I'm, what I'm here to do. And I think all of us and people struggling with, with a variety of, of mental health issues, um, my experience has been that it, it's more of a, of a spiritual issue than I think it is a social issue. And I think when you truly know yourself, you're willing to see yourself and love yourself, the resources to deal with anything in life, uh, I truly believe that, that they show up. And you know, as I, as I move forward on, on my journey, I, I look forward to more opportunities to, to stand in front of people with courage and talk about the difficult truths and, and share my story. Because I don't think anyone should have to suffer the way that too many people have, have suffered already. And I, I wanna thank all of you for listening to me. And I, you know, I pray that my words provide some insight, some solace, and some help to you all, and, uh, and thank you.